Hey everyone, welcome to episode three of my limited series on Azure Container Apps with Mass Transit. The first two episodes were pretty, pretty dense, not gonna lie, but I wanna knock this information out because it's really a hands-on experience to kind of dig into this. And I've been messing with this stuff for just a couple days now. I'm still super stoked about it, which is why I'm like binge producing instead of, you know, the alternative of binge watching. Um, I'm knocking these episodes out because it's fresh in my mind. I'm learning new things and I'm putting a lot of different moving parts of mass transit into play within the environment. So I'm going to continue and pick up where I left off on season two. The new code is out on GitHub. Let, let's jump in. I've added a bunch of cool stuff. So if you remember in the last episode, we added a separate worker project that runs in a separate container that has a separate deployment. So we have two separate deployments. And one of the things that I wanted to reiterate is that the cool thing about Azure Container Apps is because of the scaling rules, you can scale them to zero, giving them a cost model that is the same as Azure Functions, if not less, with a much cleaner deployment model, in my opinion. Anybody who's been on my Discord channel knows my opinion of Azure Functions. You know, the, the tight coupling to the versions of the packages and just, the deployment, the testing, the inability to F5. I mean, I can go F5 and unit test my code all day long. Azure Functions, not so much. So yesterday, well, yesterday, I guess it was yesterday, when I knocked this video out, I'm scaled to zero. I have a dashboard here in Azure. Both of my containers, both the API and the worker, are scaled to zero and have been scaled to zero for a long time. If I go into the namespace, and look at the container app, I can see the sample API container. And I know this is small, I don't really, I guess I can try to make the font bigger, maybe that'll help. Um, if I look at the scale rules for my API, I'm scaling purely based off concurrent HTTP connections. If I go to try to look at the log stream, you'll see, boom, it's scaled to zero. If I go look at the sample container app for the worker, same story, except, if I look at the log stream, you can see it's at zero. If I look at the scaling rules, you'll notice that there's three rules. And this is where I'm gonna get into the changes that are part of episode three. I've put three separate queues into uh, the worker, a single worker container that has three different components in it, but because we can have multiple scaling rules, if any messages show up in any of these queues, it will wake up the worker and do, this, do the things. So let me jump into the code and show what's new. Because we're using Azure Container Apps, we're naturally using Azure Service Bus because those scaling rules go straight off Azure's queue depths. And I've been able to actually ratchet this up with multiple instances of the queue receiver just by getting it busy and putting some delays in. Um, but nonetheless, I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the new code here. So in the worker, previously we had a handler. I went ahead and made this a full-on legit consumer because why not? I mean, it seems like something to do. Um, just to kind of clean it up. It also has a definition which just has some basic stuff in it. I don't even really need that, but I put it in there for fun. The big addition is when the submit order consumer runs, it does two things. It publishes an order submission, submitted event, and if a response was requested, it goes ahead and sends that response back. This lets us do both fire and forget publishes of submit order, as well as request response of submit order. You know, one of the questions I get a lot is, why are you using request response for a command? Well, some people like to wait. I don't. So I could publish or I could get a response. Because I'm checking if the response is accepted, I can optionally send that response if it was requested. So just kind of a nice thing in the consumer there and a little logic, and I'm dumping that log message out. The other cool thing I had is, what is that order submitted message used? Well, because we're using Azure Service Bus, Azure Service Bus queues can optionally be set to require a session. And a session is uniquely identified by a session ID across the queues in the system. And in this case, I'm using the order ID as that session ID. So you'll notice within the configuration code, I did something here. I did this send filter where for any message sent, that's implemented from order message, which is everything. I mean, all of my messages have that base record type on them. I use a session ID formatter where I take that order ID and I convert it to a string. And so that is gonna make sure that anytime a message is sent on Azure Service Bus, 
it has the session ID property assigned that order ID value. And so when I produce that order submitted event, that session ID will be on there. And how we can use that is in our service, which is the worker, you can see I have the submit order consumer, I have a validation consumer, which I'll cover later, and then I have my order state machine. And that order state machine is using the message session repository. So this is a repository built into the service bus transport that's part of mass transit that lets you store Saga state in the session. So you don't need a backing database. The limitation here is that any messages going to that Saga have to have the session ID set to that session ID, which is kind of like saying the same thing. That's the key because that allows Azure to correlate that session state with that consumer. And it actually does a full distributed lock on this. So you're guaranteed in order messaging within a session, which is super cool within a queue, within a session. So that's super cool. Kind of a feature that's very unique to Azure. I've never seen it in another broker. Um, and so, yeah, something that if you just have simple Saga needs, the session might be the way to go on that. It is a little bit slower than just a regular fire and forget message consumer, but you know, you're, you're getting a little bit of performance impact for a lot of benefit. And in reality, it isn't that big of a performance impact considering the, the need for a backing service like Postgres or Mongo or Redis or something. So let's dig into that state machine. So the order state machine is of course a state machine. It has a number of events that it observes, order submitted, order status requested, I'll cover that. And because I wanted to make sure that I could wake up the worker, I put a schedule in here and I'm using the Azure Service Bus scheduler. Service Bus has the built-in ability to set an NQ time for a message. So I can delay a message in there. And I did this purely to show that the workers wake up when the queues get messages without being hit by my API. So in this case, I schedule an event. I, I specify a delay when I create the message if I want to, otherwise it's randomly assigned. And it's just a fulfillment delay for the order because we don't have a warehouse. You know, I don't want to overcomplicate the sample. And all this does is pushes the message out in the future when an order is validated to say, okay, I'm going to be fulfilled sometime in the next 30 minutes. Simple enough story. I also have a request to actually validate the request. And I'm using a time span of zero for the timeout because I don't want to schedule a timeout. The way timeouts work with state machines, if you know you're gonna get a positive or negative result eventually, don't deal with the timeout, it's not important, just turn it off. So initially when the order is submitted, I'm gonna store that submitted date, I'm gonna capture that fulfillment delay, and if there isn't one, I'm just gonna randomly pick one for the next 30 minutes, which I did not know random.shared existed, but I am never calling new random ever again. So awesome, that was a new discovery. Uh, I then transition to the submitted state and I fire off that validation request. Now this validate order is handled by the validation consumer. It's just a simple, I mean, again, these orders are dumb because I wanted to keep this as simple as possible. All it does is say, hey, the order was validated. It took me a second to do it. And then it responds with that order validated message. So nothing super complex, but just something to introduce some interaction between the saga and to show that state being reloaded. So when the validation request is completed, I'm going to publish the order accepted, which nobody is listening to right now. I'm going to schedule that order fulfillment for that message, and it's going to use that default delay provider up here, which is going to use the fulfillment delay that's part of the Saga properties. I'm going to set I'm scheduling it so that I know when it's going to happen because I got tired of guessing. And then I'm going to transition to accepted. I added another handle in here for during accepted when the fulfillment is received, basically when that scheduled event fires, it sets that it's fulfilled, transitions to fulfilled, and all is good. Now you'll not remember that I had this order status requested up here. The order status requested event can be received in any state, and all it does is respond with the order status if it exists in a few properties. And the order status is pretty simple. It's just status submitted fulfilled, pretty, pretty brainless. The, uh, the way that order status comes in though is the order controller, if you remember, we had that get method in there, but we weren't really using it. Now I've put the, made it so that get method works. I'll either get an order status or an order not found, and then I can return okay or not found on the call to order with the ID. So that just completes out our controller, and I'll show that in Postman that way, that, how that works. 
So all of this code is up and running already. I've deployed it. You can see that my actions deployed 15 hours ago. It's been up and running. I'm scaled to zero as we saw from the dashboard. So now I'm gonna go over to Postman and I'm gonna submit a new order. I'm just gonna say send. Now this is gonna be a cold boot. All the services, all the queues, everything is basically asleep at this point. So let's punch the clock. We're gonna send the request. Azure is gonna go, whoa, I gotta spin up these containers. Let's get this going. On average, it's been taking like nine seconds. We'll see how fast the clouds are today. It must be really cold in central US region. Okay, 17.6 seconds, okay. That took longer than I expected, but hey, it's not a big deal. You know, you can always just tell them to scale to one if you really need response time. Okay, now we're at 200 milliseconds, 113. These are some high numbers, higher than I expected. Because yesterday I was getting about 75 milliseconds. You know, I don't think I'm on dial up. Okay, some are dropping sub 100. Okay, nah, light and variable, partly cloudy. You know, we'll see. All right, so that's saying I'm gonna take one of these order IDs now. And I'm gonna go over here to my get order status because I haven't figured out how to chain commands in Postman yet. I'm gonna send the request to get the order status and boom, we can see my order was accepted. It was submitted at this time. It has not been fulfilled yet and that's the order ID. Let's go see what's happening in Azure because we can actually get really good visibility into this. Let's look at my workers log stream. I can see, oh look, I have orders being validated. I have scheduled fulfillments, six minutes, eight minutes. We're not gonna wait on this video for any of those to be filled. Trust me though, it wakes up the instance. It's super cool and then it spins down like after three minutes. So super cool there. Uh, so yeah, we're seeing orders submitted, orders validated, all the goodness that we would expect to see. If we go look at sample container app, we can see that it's spun up as well. Being able to connect log, you can actually shell into the container too. You can get a console right into the container with Bash. So that's kind of neat too, if you just punch over here. You can also track the metrics. If I go back to my dashboard now, I can refresh this and you can see that I'm now at one worker for each one because I haven't exactly been hitting it really hard. Um, but yeah, now my response times are pretty close to what's expected, you know. So it's, it's light and variable, could be. I think I'm gonna put Cloudflare in front of this to see if it makes it slower and also to get rid of that really annoying long URL. Um, but that'll be a next kind of thing. But yeah, so we're up and running, it's working. I'm happy with it. I don't think it, there's anything else super exciting to do on this one. Um, so yeah, so the latest code is up there, obviously, because it's connected in GitHub and it's built. Uh, you can see the different projects. I also added another unit test project to test the state machine by itself. Here I just add the consumers and test it, and we can see that that all runs. The API test also still works. So if I go into the API test and run it, you know, I can see that that works as well. That's using the web application factory with the existing service. And in this case, I am just using that mock handler for the submit order that I added. So thanks for joining. Still super soaked about Azure Container Apps. Um, yeah, these things are cool. Uh, I'll, I'm pretty much done. I don't have a whole lot more to cover. I mean, I could go deep on any of the Azure subjects, but if you want anything specifically fleshed out, drop a note in the comments and uh, we'll see what we can do. Other than that, thanks for joining. Have a great day.